No survivors. Two horrific plane crashes less than five months apart, raising new questions about the safety of air travel. Was it pilot error or a defective aircraft that doomed Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302? And was it just coincidence that the very same aircraft model, a Boeing 737 MAX 8, crashed under similar circumstances just five months earlier in Indonesia? To get answers, I will speak to aviation and industry experts, including an airline pilot who has flown the Boeing 737 MAX. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. 157 people, including eight Americans, killed in a plane crash in Ethiopia. This tragedy began at 5.41 a.m. on March 11th when a Boeing 737 MAX 8 took off from Addis Ababa Airport en route to Nairobi. It climbed to 8,600 feet when it vanished from radar, crashing just southeast of the Ethiopian capital. The United States has now joined other countries from around the world in grounding that model aircraft after investigators noted similarities to an earlier crash involving another Boeing 737 MAX 8 jet. We have more from VOA Patsy Wida Kuswara. The 737 MAX 8, Boeing's best-selling jet, will no longer fly the U.S. skies after President Trump declared an emergency order to ground it. I didn't want to take any chances. We didn't have to make this decision today. We could have delayed it. We maybe didn't have to make it at all, but I felt, I felt it was important both psychologically and in a lot of other ways. The day prior to Trump's announcement, Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg spoke with Trump by phone and reassured him the aircraft is safe. As a key military contractor, Boeing is a major lobbying force in Washington. Through a statement, Boeing said they support the temporary grounding but continues to have full confidence in the safety of the 737 MAX. Boeing shares have dropped 15 percent since Sunday's crash. The 737 MAX jets have crashed twice in five months, killing nearly 350 people, including those on board Indonesian Lion Air that crashed in October. A few hours before Trump's announcement, Canada joined dozens of countries in banning the aircraft. The new information, and I hasten to say this is new information uh, that we received and analyzed, comes from validated satellite tracking data suggesting a possible although unproven similarity in the flight profile of the Lion Air aircraft. Ethiopian authorities have recovered the aircraft's black boxes. The flight data and cockpit voice recorders will provide important clues about the cause of the crash. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. Even as investigators move forward to find out what happened to Flight 302, there are questions whether Boeing has been completely forthcoming. Did Boeing know something and not do enough to warn pilots? Are there unique engineering characteristics of this aircraft that pilots should have been alerted to? And more importantly, with adequate warning, could a more experienced pilot have made a difference, a life or death difference? We spoke with Captain Dennis Tager, spokesperson for the Allied Pilots Association, which represents the 15,000 pilots of American Airlines. He has been a pilot for 32 years and has logged thousands of flying hours and has flown the 737, including the 737 MAX 8. We asked Captain Tager to describe his initial reaction to flying Boeing's newest airplane. And the displays are, are different. I mean, they're laid out a, a bit different. So in, in, in aviation, uh, pilots are, are creatures of habit. And when you're familiar with th where things are, it, it becomes ingrained and part of the uh, uh, tapestry of how you operate in the cockpit. So those were some changes. They weren't um, uh, hindrances to the operation of the aircraft nor the safety of margin, but it's just like any human exper uh, experience, you, you have to get used to it. So uh, the actual flying of the aircraft, it was smooth. It, it, in many cases, uh, chatted with the FO, I, I like the way this thing flies. So um, whatever software control laws that we're learning about that have been installed on the aircraft, the SANS, the the MCAS, the Maneuvering Characteristic Augmentation System, which we knew nothing about. Um, whatever the, Boeing had done to the aircraft, we, we were pleased with, um, I was pleased with how it flew and handled, and uh, the new engines, uh, different to start them, and some other um, uh, technical aspects with which we were trained on, um, all uh, performed as advertised. 
You say your understanding of the MAX 8 changed drastically after the Lion Air crash in Indonesia last year. Absolutely. When that crash happened, Boeing on the, I believe it was the 6th of November, and followed the next day by the FAA Emergency Airworthiness Directive, disclosed to us a system which was not in our books, non-existent. We weren't trained on it, we weren't aware of it, and we weren't the only ones. Our company, American Airlines, and as I understand, all the companies throughout the globe, in their flight manuals provided to them from Boeing, this information was not disclosed. So then we asked some serious questions. What else on the aircraft have we not been made aware of? And let's get to the MCAS and how does that work? Why does it? Why is it on the aircraft? Explain the software that Boeing installed to make sure the MAX 8 engines don't stall. What is MCAST and how does it work? The MCAST system exists because the engines on the 737 MAX are further up on the wing. They're larger. When they test flew it, they told us that they found when they went to a recovery and you threw the engines up, it caused the pitch, the nose of the aircraft to pitch up, which is counter to what the pilot's trying to do. So they said the only way they could get around that was to design this system, the MCAS system, which would essentially assist in getting the aircraft nose down, the pilot, because these engines, they, when they accelerate, it wants it to pitch up, so it pushes the aircraft nose down so that the pilot can recover from a stall in certain regimes. So are you saying tragedy might have been averted if the pilots had been more familiar with the software or knew how it worked? Well, certainly the Lion Air having information prior, um, I don't know what would have happened, pilot uh, awareness. And, and now with the Ethiopian, you mentioned, asked me before, if the Ethiopian pilots uh, could have done anything. I don't know. Um, we don't know what exactly happened there, but if it's a parallel of Lion Air, this thing happens, this software brings in such dramatic control change so quickly that even if you knew the system existed and how to counter it, it's, it's, it's much like what Captain uh, Sullenberg talked about and you've seen in the movies. There's reaction time. You need a little time to process what's going on. It's down to seconds, but we need reaction time to identify. That's what the problem is. There it is. There's a solution. And seconds count in this particular software uh, design. And um, that's going to be corrected um, on a multitude of levels. Two sensors required is what we're hearing. Good. Not relentlessly triggering this. Perhaps an initial charge and then a second evaluation. Not to full nose down limit. These are questions that our pilots asked after the Lion Air crash. And... Um, and they're out on the line, they're out in a the foxhole doing this every day. And they're on the airplane with our passengers. They're the last line of defense and the last line of authority to approve a safe flight. So that's why they ask these questions. They're highly trained, highly experienced in the U.S., but not if we don't have the information. Captain Tager says he is confident Boeing will make all that information available to pilots before any of these new planes are back in the air. In the meantime, the Ethiopian Airlines crash touched many countries across the globe, 35 nations to be exact. Here are the countries of origin for the 157 victims of Flight 302. Aboard the flight, 18 Canadians, 9 Ethiopians, China, Italy, and the U.S. all had 8 of its citizens each. France and the United Kingdom had 7 each. Egypt had 6, and Germany had 5 passengers on board that flight. 27 other countries were home to 43 additional passengers. But the country that lost the most citizens on board Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 is Kenya with 32 passengers. And behind each of the victims is a family in deep mourning. 34-year-old Abdullahi Ibrahim was just one of the 32 Kenyans who perished in this Nairobi-bound flight. His family, like the families of the under 156 people on that ill-fated flight, are still trying to come to terms with the unexpected tragedy. VOA's Rail Umbor has more in our report, narrated by Plugged In's Valikia Newsom. Mourners gather in Nairobi's Kaipira neighborhood at the home of Abdullahi Ibrahim, one of 149 passengers who perished on board Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. 
His sister, Aisha, spoke with Abdullahi by phone just hours before the crash. The last time I saw my brother was a year ago when he came back from vacation. I spoke to him the night before he boarded the flight. He said that I should not tell the extended family that he was coming. He wanted it to be a surprise. Sunday's crash was the deadliest in Ethiopian Airlines history. The plane, a Boeing 737 MAX 8, crashed just six minutes after takeoff near the Ethiopian town of Bishoftu, killing all 157 people on board. Recovering victims' bodies may be difficult due to the force of the crash, but Abdullahi's relatives say they haven't given up hope. The way I talked to my brother, I told him that even if a piece if a piece can be identified, it is good for him to come with it so that we can bury it. Mm. Mm. But ho hopefully, when it reaches seven days, you are going to do some prayers. Similarities between the Ethiopian air tragedy and another off the Java Sea in Indonesia just five months earlier, which killed all 189 people on board, prompted the Ethiopian airline and most of the world's nations to take action. We have grounded all Boeing B737-8 MAX fleet, which Ethiopian Airlines was operating and which was involved in yesterday's accident as a precaution safety measure. But this does not mean that the incident was related with defects on this specific fleet. But we have taken this as an extra safety precaution. As researchers comb through the wreckage, Abdullahi's family prays for closure. But with or without a body, Abdullahi's family tells VOA their mourning will continue. Valikia Newsom for reporter Rael Ambor in Nairobi, VOA News. We are joined by Salem Solomon of VOA's Africa Division. Salem recently wrote an article for VOA about the extraordinary young captain of the doomed Ethiopian Airlines flight. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, what can you tell me about the background of this pilot? So the pilot, uh, he was a prodigy, basically. He started flying when he was a teenager. But, uh, you know, in fact, the attention was on the pilot right when people saw his picture because he looks so young. Uh, despite his looks, he is extremely experienced. He had 8,000 hours of flight under his belt. Uh, people spoke about him. Uh, he was an A student. He was uh, extremely talented and uh, uh, he was experienced and also took the training shortly after the Indonesian uh, accident. So the training having to deal with um, this particular uh, s system in the cockpit? this particular aircraft, MAX 8. Uh, and so the experience was not an issue in terms of uh, the pilot. Um, VOA Amharic service uh, reporter Tsion Girma spoke to his father who's, who's in deep mourning and he spoke about his son and the kind of disciplined and experienced uh, uh, child, a special child he was, a very distraught, uh, trusting us um, an exclusive interview. Uh, and, and in it he explains uh, the character uh, of the pilot. You know, I read that the co-pilot had only 200 hours compared to the extensive 8,000 hours and I, and I checked with some pilots, 8,000 is, is, a, is a good number, is a significant experience. Um, anything we know about the co-pilot that you know about the co-pilot? The co-pilot uh, was uh, relatively new compared to the pilot, but the pilot flies the, the, the plane. And uh, just to just add uh, the experience that the, the, the pilot brings into uh, this uh, you know, conversation is that he was an A student. He was extremely disciplined in that way. Um, and uh, I don't think experience was, uh, was a factor in this, in this case well, from what it, we've heard. Well, I think as the investigation goes on, I mean, if, you know, we don't know. I mean, there's still much to be learned, but if there is what people suspect, I mean, in many ways the pilots are sabotaged in the cockpit if they have the systems giving them faulty information. 
I mean, that, that's, the, that's still an, an undergoing investigation going on. Um, but uh, as I said, you know, uh, Ethiopian Airlines is a, is, is a very, uh, you know, safe fastest, airlines. Safe airlines, fastest growing in Africa. And um, they don't have any reputation for cutting corners. They're very business, uh, uh, they're very uh, safety conscious business. And they haven't had uh, a lot of accidents in the past. So that's very yeah. worth noting when you're talking about, uh, you know, the context of what happened. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, the families mourn transportation and safety investigators in France are busy examining flight data from the downed plane. They are looking for any clues that might identify what caused the fatal crash of Ethiopian Air Flight 302. To tell us what investigators are hoping to learn, we are joined by Gregory Fife, former senior air safety investigator with the National Transportation Safety Board. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Greta. Any thoughts, just as to start with, this is a, an American-made plane, a Boeing. Um, the, the investigation seems to be led by, uh, by the French. The, 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 the recording boxes, the black boxes have been, sell, been sent to France. Why? Let me see if I can clarify some of the points that, uh, that the other guests have brought up and your question here. The Ethiopians are in charge of this investigation. And while they didn't have the expertise and the facilities to read out the boxes, they were looking for an other country that had the resources and the technicians to be able to at least download the data from one medium to another medium so that they could use it to analyze what was going on. So the French aren't in, aren't in charge of this investigation. It was just that their facility was used to transfer the medium into a usable um, uh, document so that the investigators could analyze the data. So the Ethiopians are still in charge. All, right. All they did was download that data and give it to the Ethiopians. All right, you've investigated crashes. You've been the head of a GO team for the NTSB here in the United States. Tell me, how do you begin to investigate this? When it comes to a foreign investigation, it's, it's substantially different than what we would do here in the United States. As an accredited representative participating in someone else's investigation, in this case the Ethiopians, the NTSB sends an accredited rep and a number of folks with them from both the NTSB and the manufacturer. In this case, it's Boeing and, of course, the FAA. Boeing is the manufacturer. FAA is the certifying authority responsible for continued airworthiness. All the board and its technical advisors can do to Ethiopia is provide technical assistance. They participate in all aspects of the investigation. They provide uh, technical expertise and interpretation of data. And if there's something that needs to come from the manufacturer as far as technical data, it's an instant resource. But the board doesn't run this investigation, the Ethiopians do, under ICAO Annex 13. All right, well, it seems the, the Lion Air crash, which is eerily similar, and this is early, so I'm not going to say they're the same. I'm not going to go out on the limb, but there's no question that people are highly suspicious that it's the same thing. They had a lot of the same characteristics. Uh, that happened on October 29th. Uh, has, has Boeing, I mean, has the investigation pretty much been finished with that, or people have concluded what happened with that flight? I would hope not, because there is still a lot of information that has yet to be forthcoming. Some of the new information out of Lion Air is about the airplane that was being flown by a separate flight crew the day before that had experienced some sort of pitch problem and that the crew was able to remedy that situation and successfully land the airplane. There's a lot of backstory to that particular issue. It all starts with a faulty angle of attack indicator probe, which initiated the, uh, the, at least the triggering of these, this MCAT system. Are all the angle of attack sensors, are they made by the same manufacturer? I mean, there's a tension on Boeing, but who manufactures this angle of attack sensor? Well, that's the big question, Greta, is was this a supplier problem? Is there a chronic problem with somebody who manufactured it outside of Boeing and there was a fault with it? And, you know, we've seen it in recalls of drugs and parts of, of cars where you had a faulty manufacturing process that affected tens, twenties, thirties, uh, you know, uh, parts and that kind of stuff. So that's part of the investigation that needs to be looked at. Because if you have a faulty system and it triggers this MCAS and the pilots try to recover, all of a sudden now this, this uh, faulty part is continually giving faulty indications. And it may prevent the crew from absolutely recovering as they should because they're getting faulty information. And that has to be 
considered, not only in Lion Air, but of course in Ethiopia as well. All right, this MCAS system, um, you know, obviously all the attention is on it, and if you're just taking off, you don't have much room for recovery. You're at, you know, 5,000 feet or whatever it is, compared to if you're at 39,000 feet if you had a problem. Is it possible that there are other similar problems and that we don't yet know about them as a consumer, as a passenger, because the attention is on the two fatalities? I think you bring up a good point there. We have to look at both of these accidents. Everybody wants to make this about the MCAS system, and they're trying to draw very close parallels between the two. Unfortunately, the Ethiopians, now that they've had the, they have the data downloaded from the CBR and the FDR, have been very tight-lipped about providing any information, not only to the public, but to the folks involved, that is Boeing, NTSB, and the FAA. And so the question is, what was the triggering event in Ethiopia, and was it the same as in Lion Air? Because you can have other, other issues with unreliable airspeed that could give you a similar type profile if the pilots are reacting properly or improperly to that kind of fault versus an angle of attack indicator as we've seen in yeah. Lion Air. All right, the 737 is a workhorse around the world. We fly them all the time in the United States. There's so many different generations, so many different models. Is a 737 MAX 8 a, 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 is a significantly different model than the previous 737s? And is, is it in part because the engines are farther up to the front of the plane ca causing a, an issue really of, you know, of, of balance, of force? Is, is, that, is, that, is this a bit different plane than the other 737s. When you look at the, the MAX compared to the older generation airplanes, it is different because the engines are, are forward on the wing. The wing is actually different. The landing gear is different. But when you look at the cockpit, as the captain stated previously, there are some you know, um, ergonomic things where they have bigger uh, screens and that kind of stuff, but they still have some of the old technology, like the old trim wheel. And so during the course of certification, the FAA sets a standard that the airplane has to meet. And if they're trying to keep a common type rating, then the FAA dictates if you want to keep this as a common type rating with the older generation 737s, you have to do certain things. And I think through the investigative process, that information will come out what was done to keep the airplane in the family of 737s rather than creating a separate new type rating for pilots who would have to have different types of training. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. You're welcome. The question many, of course, will ask when a commercial jetliner goes down, how safe is flying? Let's take a look at the numbers. According to the Bureau of Aircraft Accidents Archives in Geneva, Switzerland, there were a total of 113 aircraft accidents in 2018, resulting in over 1,000 fatalities. So far, there have been 20 this year, over 200 deaths. And since 2010, there have been more than 1,182 aircraft accidents and more than 7,770 deaths. But here are a few more facts. Between 1983 and 2000, 95% of all the people involved in airplane crashes survived. And according to the Aviation Safety Network, the accident rate for every 1 million commercial flights in 2017 was less than 0.5%. By comparison, about one and a quarter million people are killed in road and traffic accidents worldwide each year. That is about 3,287 deaths every single day. And if you are between the ages of 15 and 29, motor vehicle accidents are the leading cause of death. Well, if you still have concerns about the safety of air travel, you may want to listen to my next guest. Richard Abulafia is vice president of analysis at one of the leading aerospace and defense consulting groups in the country. He's also a columnist for Aviation Week, Space Technology, and Forbes.com. Nice to talk to you, sir. Good to be here. Thank um, you. I'll go out on a limb and say I, I think flying is safe, obviously, in, in, in the face of these two crashes, but I'll let you answer. Do you think flying in general is safe? Obviously not in these two aircraft. You know, this is a, a terrible tragedy compounding the previous tragedy last September in Indonesia. But at the end of the day, when you look at the numbers, this is actually the safest form of transport ever designed by nature or humans. It's a remarkable story, and it's getting better with each passing generation. Well, you know, in spite of that, um, you know, it, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to be suspicious of this particular aircraft and not want to get on them. Of course, they have been grounded here in the United States and, ar and around the world. But, you know, the thing that, that naturally... Uh, it, grabs my attention, has Boeing told us everything it knows? 
Well, we, we're going to look into that. They're going to look into that. Uh, they're going to go over everything with a fine-tooth comb. This was a long evolutionary process of creating a new version of the 737. Um, and obviously, there have been multiple probes and rumored to be underway. But uh, at, at the end of the day, they have a very strong interest in making the situation right. Uh, so they're going to they're going to do everything they can. But I guess it's a little different situation is that, you know, is that they, they had noticed last October with the first 737 MAX 8 going down. And of course, we you know, we still don't have the conclusive results there. But, the, you know, it's fair to if, it, if they're both the same cause, if it turns out there are certainly it's not uh, irresponsible or, or irrational to ask whether they, they should have been grounded back in October. It's reasonable. But you look at the accident back in uh, at, in Lion Air. Uh, there were many compounding mistakes. Like? Uh, well, uh, it was clear that that plane was not airworthy, and yet somehow it was Meaning permitted. that the day before it had a similar incident. And there were previous incidents. For some reason... Just for this particular aircraft or this model this of aircraft? This particular of aircraft. Air. Not the model, but this particular aircraft. And yet somehow the, the crew wasn't properly notified that this was an issue. So there are all kinds of issues at play here. As, as your previous guest, uh, Mr. Fife, pointed out, you know, it's never just one story of one system on one aircraft. The, there are numerous compounding factors, and that's one of uh, several that took place in Lion Air. Well, if it turns out that the pilots were struggling, the plane's going up and down, up and down, and, and it's on takeoff at a low altitude, it seems that you know, there's an incredible amount of similarity. So it's not, it's not irrational to think that the same cause. Yes, that's correct. I mean, of course, it could turn out to be something very different. That's correct. But there are procedures, and maybe, maybe this is a matter of training, maybe it's a matter of software. It ultimately can be made good, assuming that this is everything and there are no showstoppers. But if it's a, if it's a if it's faulty sensor, bad software, um, it is tr proper training shouldn't be the answer to it. Boeing should correct it so it's not you know, a bad product, bad sensor, or, or bad um, software. That's exactly right. Because you right. shouldn't have to train around a potential uh, uh, catastrophic event. That's exactly right. But nevertheless, the accidents, the disasters that took place would have been compounded by these things. So in other words, this is not a fatally flawed product or something that has to be completely redesigned. This is a series of discrete and manageable issues that may or may not include training changes. What's the impact on Boeing? Well, you know, this is why only very big companies with deep resources can build jets, because this is going to be costly. You know, there are so many forms of, uh, of expense here uh, for this tragedy. And, but, you know, it, it could come to a billion dollars in terms of compensation, in terms of uh, what they have to give to airlines to that's make it good. That's assuming they an expense whether or not those planes get up and running again, too. I mean, that's I mean, that's I'm, correct. You know, they're going to they're gonna have to figure that out, so that's another expense. There's a lot of variables, but I think a reasonable best case scenario is in the hundreds of millions or a billion. But at the end of the day, this is a company that earned about $10 billion last year. In other words, it's going to be painful, but this is also not a real threat to their future competitiveness. Well, they don't, they don't have a lot of competition. What's it, the Airbus, the French-made Airbus is the main competition of both? Pan-European Airbus, uh, centered mostly in France, that's yeah. right. And, and that's their main competition? Yes. The aircraft industry is a duopoly with very high barriers to entry. It's very hard to break into it. You know, I thought it was interesting is that when that uh, Boeing, that flight went down in Malaysia and they found part of the plane later, um, they, the, it, the part went to France for identification. And it was a Boeing plane, a 777. Um, this also went from Ethiopia, the black box, to France to, be, to have them figure out what was in the black box. Uh, is there any reason why it doesn't come here to the United States? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Some people have opined that maybe pe the, the people involved uh, in the airline are, are afraid of having any kind of perceived conflict of interest between, say, Boeing and the FAA. Another possibility is that, frankly, the, the French agency is, is really good at what they do. They're very well resourced. And, the, and of course, the black box is going to give us a wealth of information. That's wealth right. Wealth of information. Um, anyway, what a terrible tragedy for yes. these families. Thank you very much for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice of America. And you can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And do follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being with us. Stay plugged in.